So when the jazz drops, you know what time it is. It's time for That Racing History Podcast, which, as always, is brought to you by me, Aidan Millward. Taking the old format of the YouTube series Storytime, rewriting it, correcting all those mistakes, eliminating ways in which people can try to be clever in the comments section and all that to bring you a different Storytime recipe that has the same great taste. It's the Pepsi Max of motorsport, I guess. Hashtag not sponsored. And in this podcast, I don't just cover teams that came and went or eras of days gone by that we look at with rose-tinted goggles and stuff like that. This podcast also looks at individual uh, well, individuals and individual races. And today, I've got one of those individual races for you. Today, we're looking at a race that produced a hectic and chaotic event and also produced an unlikely winner. We're talking today about the 1996 Monaco Grand Prix. Now, forgive me if a lot of this is a direct rip from the 1996 season review VHS tape. I watched that so much as a kid, I can recite most of it word for word. Monaco is a bit like Bathurst and the Nürburgring. It's regarded as one of the world's most difficult tracks. And while there are so many people out there looking for that perfect lap around the Nordschleife in real life or on a set of Corsa in a GT3, for open wheelers, there is no better place for bragging rights than going balls to the wall around the streets of Monte Carlo faster than anybody else on the grid. Especially when the cars are a bit more spec than F1 cars. Because it really is biggest balls wins in that case, but still, even if you have the fastest car, you've still got to get it all hooked up. There's no room for error as there's walls either side of the track, there's little to no runoff area on each corner, and a safety car is guaranteed if someone does crash. And over the years, the walls have claimed the egos of many drivers. Ayrton and Senna crashed down to the lead at Portier in 1988. Max Verstappen crashed every day across a race weekend in 2016. Felipe Massa went in heavily at San Devot, and so on. Even though many of the drivers know their way around, since most of them live within about a mile and a half of the track, very few have mastered the place. Senna, Hill and Schumacher are the three that spring to mind. Bathurst and the Nordschleife have got overtaking zones and long straights leading into those braking zones. Bathurst has the chase, for example. The Nordschleife has the Dirtinger Ho straight where you can just slipstream on by or use Turn 1 if you're on the combined GP Nordschleife course. Monaco has none of those things. Monaco is narrow, walled, and penalises you in a huge way if you stuff it up. It is then a circuit that's seen the best and the worst over the years. It's where Senna did that lap, basically one-handed in his McLaren. It's where Alberto Ascari got launched into the harbour, and where Lorenzo Bandini met his fate at the chicane in 1967. That was a race where those who were there said they could smell his burning flesh for the remainder of the race. It also has to be said that the reports of Senna being two seconds faster than Prost in one of those qualifying sessions, looking at you Mr Clarkson, are a little... exaggerated. Back then, it was two qualifying sessions. One on Thursday, yeah, it's usually Friday, but this is Monaco, and one on the Saturday. The fastest time you set over those two sessions is what's used for your qualifying time. So you could be 12th fastest on the Saturday, but still start on pole because your fastest time on the Friday was still good enough. And that session format was scrapped for 1996, this year that we're talking about, and replaced by the single 1 hour 12 lap limit that people know and love. Not saying that the current format is bad though. You know, I distinctly remember those one-hour sessions being slow cars go out for the first 10 minutes, 40 minutes or so of nothing, and then Schumacher and the other fast cars will bang in one last YOLO lap because the cars were far superior back then. Tangents aside, sounding like my old music teacher, Senna was faster than Prost by two seconds in that first qualifying session. In the second Saturday session, that gap had come down to 1.4 seconds, and it was Prost and Senna's second qualifying time that was used. And yes, 1.4 seconds is still a massive gap considering that they're both great drivers in the same car, but 1.4 seconds isn't 2 seconds. Also, that onboard lap was from 189, I believe. No footage of the 88 lap exists, sadly. Back to 1996, though. This was race number 5 of a 16-round season. Yep, the wait in those days between seasons starting was October to March, rather than December to March as it is now. So in the up to four week gaps between races, teams would be doing a lot of private testing, racking up bills into the hundreds of thousands of pounds to do so. Except Ferrari who use Maranello and Mugello, which they own, and Ligier who use Manicor for free because political mates, which we might have to revisit in the future. 
Following the previous round at Imola, Damon Hill led the championship with 43 points, thanks to four wins and a fourth place at the Nürburgring, which was a points tally almost double that of his teammate Jacques Villeneuve, who was in second with 22. Michael Schumacher was third with 16, Jean Alesi fourth with 11, and Eddie Irvine in the second Ferrari fifth, with nine points. Williams was racing away with the Constructors' Championship on 65 points, a full 40 ahead of Ferrari with 25, Benetton had 18, McLaren on 9, and Jordan were enjoying a decent 1996 so far in 5th with 8 points. And just as a reminder, in 1996 the points were awarded from 1st to 6th, 10, 6, 4, 3, 2, 1, rather than the 25, 18, whatever it is down to 10th that is awarded today. Not even a point for fastest lap in those days either. At the start of the weekend in the years leading up to the 1996 race, nobody had won the Grand Prix from lower than 8th, and even then that was because Monaco was always a race of attrition. Brakes would go, driver error would mean a shunt into the barriers, and gearboxes would fail after going up and down the gears too many times for the box to take. It seemed, with the dominance of the Williams team so far this season and the re-emergence of Ferrari, it would be either one of those two teams on pole position. Add in the fact that Williams had won every race up until this point, Damon Hill winning four races and Jacques Villeneuve one race, it would be certain that it would be one of those two Williams cars on the top step of the podium. But Schumacher wasn't totally out of it though, it could still be a three horse race for the checker flag. After all, Schumacher had finished second in the preceding San Marino Grand Prix and had grabbed pole position for that race. The Ferrari 310 was highly unreliable, but was a front running car when it did work. The team had to run 1995 parts in the early season while they figured out problems with the car. But the Ferraris had been on the pace at Melbourne, but they found that the new titanium gearbox was bleeding fluid everywhere and they had to run the 1995 spec gearbox to make the end of races. But they'd got the whole thing fixed by the Nürburgring and Schumacher was back on it, finishing just behind race winner Villeneuve. And you know, obviously there is the golfing class between Schumacher and Irvine. A major embarrassment came for Ferrari at the French Grand Prix later in the season, where Schumacher's engine exploded on the formation lap, and at Montreal he was left stranded on the grid while everybody else left the line. Needless to say, the Italian press was on Ferrari's back a lot that year, since with the world champion at the team, they had to win, and when they weren't winning, they wanted Todd's head. But the Michael had come to his boss's defence and said, Jean Todd is the best man at Ferrari. If you want to destroy the team, let him go. If you want us to get within a shot of winning the title next year, let him stay. Just over 18 months later, the F310B almost won Schumacher a driver's title. Cosmic. But it seemed on this particular occasion the F310 with its decent weight distribution and the correct suspension assembly was working somewhat well, and Schumacher grabbed pole on Saturday afternoon with a 120.356, some half a second faster than Damon Hill, who only just pipped Jean Alesi. Again, Schumacher talent. But let's not discredit the rest of the team, you know, with all this. You know, Formula One is a team sport rather than a driving one. Not many people can grasp that. Some old school story time snark aside, Rubens Barrichello put his Jordan on the third row ahead of Eddie Irvine while the two Ligiers were 14th and 17th. Their Mugen Honda engines were misfiring in the session and it was the best they could do. But the car had been improving all year and it was showing promise of being a competent midfield runner, being able to fight with McLaren, Jordan and Sauber rather than against the footwork and Tyrrell cars. Forty, who were trying their best to just survive rather than qualify, put their brand new FG03s on the back row and were well within the 107% cutoff time. Andrea Montermini, the final qualifier, set a 125.393 half a second from the 125.981 cutoff. In fact, Luca Badoa was only a tenth off Ricardo Tossa Rossett's 20th place time, which in turn was two seconds slower than Pedro Lamy's 132.350. The two Minardi cars had a great qualifying run on this occasion. Martin Brundle had a terrible session and could only manage 16th in his Jordan, while Jacques Villeneuve on his first visit to the circuit could only manage 10th, a full second off his teammate. And since both Graham Hill and Gilles Villeneuve were Monaco Grand Prix winners in the past, expectations were high for the Williams drivers. But Schumacher's pole lap wasn't without controversy. After he put in his fastest lap that got him pole, Schumacher slowed to acknowledge the crowd. But Gerhard Berger was on a flying lap that would have seen him improve on his previous best, and coming through the blind right-hander in the tunnel, Berger saw Schumacher at the last second and swerved to avoid him. Berger could then be seen on TV cameras flying backwards into the chicane although the car wasn't damaged. 
Then on race day, there used to be a warm-up session where cars would be allowed to put full tanks of fuel in the car and do a series of laps, just to get used to how the car handled with full fuel and tweak final setups after the cars had been running on low fuel for qualifying. In 2003, the session was scrapped, and Friday practice was instead extended to a two-hour session as the cars had to qualify on race fuel at that time. The FIA basically figured that if they're qualifying on race fuel, then they should already be used to the car. Mosley things. In the warm-up, Olivier Panis in the Ligier went fastest, which gave his engineers hope since they'd been up all night trying to fix the misfire issue on his and Denise's cars. Villeneuve finished down in 18th as his setup had changed in anticipation of rain arriving just before the race or during the race. And Panis believed he would make the podium with how well the car had been performing in the warm-up, but his wife Anne wasn't so optimistic. Not only was Monaco ridiculously hard to overtake at, there were still several barriers between him and third place. Hill, Schumacher, Hacklin, Villeneuve, Coulthard, Irvine and Barrichello. Schumacher was already a double world champion and he would go on to win seven. Hill would win the championship in 1996, Villeneuve was the reigning Carton Indy 500 winner and would then win the F1 championship the following year, Hakkinen would then go on to be a double world champion, Coulthard would become a 13 time Grand Prix winner in a time when Hakkinen and Schumacher were top, and then Barrichello would later end up at Ferrari at their peak and finish second to Jensen Button in 2009. After the warm up though, it lashed it down. So much so that a support race had to be abandoned, and it was dark and visibility was not so good. As it had been the first time rain had fallen all weekend, the officials allowed another 15 minute warm up session to allow teams to get a wet setup sorted on the grounds of safety. It wasn't expected to rain again, but safety, especially after 1994. Andrea Montermini wrecked his 40 in the session and a lack of spare car meant there was no way he could make the start, so only 21 drivers made the start line. Several other drivers had issues in the session as well, Pedro Lamy, Pedro Diniz and Giancarlo Fisichella, but all managed to escape without damage. Hakkinen damaged his McLaren and had to resort to using the spare, and David Coulthard was using a specially prepared Monaco-only short wheelbase car, while Alesi suffered a puncture. Jos Verstappen and Ricardo Rossit didn't take part in the warm-up because footwork had no spares, just like 40, and any crash would have meant weekend over. It has to be said though, that while 40 had no spares because… it was 40, Footwork had no spare parts because Verstappen and the Tosser were doing aero and suspension development by smashing the cars into every available wall all weekend. Then at the start, in gloomy conditions and on a wet track, Hill got the better start and managed to outdrag Schumacher in the run-up to Sandevote. As the leaders started the run up the hill towards Casino Square, Verstappen, who for some reason had decided to start the race on slicks, went straight on at Sandevote and into the wall, ending his race without making the first corner. On the exit of that corner, the two Minardis of Lamy and Fisichella collided ending their race. And it was a shame to lose Verstappen so soon. After a great performance at a wet Brazilian Grand Prix in which he set the fastest lap, it was certain he'd repeat his performance. A Verstappen having a great performance in a wet Brazilian Grand Prix. Where have we heard that before? Quite ironic then that 20 years later, the son of Verstappen would be doing the same thing. Yeah, that weekend didn't go very well for him, did it? And then it was Schumacher's turn. As he came into Lower Mirabeau, which is the corner after the Lowe's hairpin, he got his right front on the inside kerb and then crippled the left front on the outside wall. A rare mistake for the Rainmaster. So by the end of the first lap, as well as Montermini, who never made the start, Verstappen, Lamy, Fisichella, Schumacher and Barrichello were all out of the race. At the end of lap two, Hill's lead over Alesi was over four seconds. Four seconds in two laps. And you think Hamilton's got it easy. Then it was the other Benetton of Berger, the remaining Ferrari of Irvine, who in turn was pursued by Frentzen in the Sauber, Coulthard's McLaren and Villeneuve in the other Williams, and Villeneuve had managed to make up three places in the opening carnage. After five laps, Ukio Katayama's Tyrrell ended up in a wall after his throttle got stuck open. The tosser also crashed out and Denise's gearbox gave up the ghost. Hill, Alesi and Berger pulled away, as Irvine led an impatient nine-car queue around the streets of Monaco. Then on lap 10, Berger had to retire as his gearbox also failed, and Frentzen lost his front wing on lap 18 after trying to overtake Irvine at Sandevote, demoting him to second last ahead of Luca Badoa's 40 that was just... making up the numbers. Poor 40. Not long after this, they'd be shafted good and proper and wouldn't finish the season. But that's a story for another day. On lap 28, Hill entered the pits for his first stop. 
topping the Williams up with fuel and making the switch to slick tyres, which allowed a lazy to head out into the lead. Irvine also pitted for slicks, as did Panis and Coulthard, and DC was wearing Schumacher's spare helmet for the race because Coulthard's kept steaming up. And Coulthard later revealed in his autobiography, It Is What It Is, that he pulled some strings to ensure that the helmet went into his collection instead of that of Ron Dennis, because with Ron Dennis, all podium trophies and memorabilia such as caps, champagne bottles, and in this case, helmets, went to the McLaren factory after the race and not to the driver's houses. After Schumacher agreed to let Coulthard keep the helmet, Coulthard had a replica made up for Dennis. He'll find out when he reads the book, Coulthard noted. He shouldn't have pissed Michael off. On lap 31, Martin Brundle's final Monaco Grand Prix ended when he spun off, which brought the number of cars running down to 11. Now, normal attrition rates had resumed by this point, but the amount of drivers remaining by the time Brundle had crashed was much lower than any year, including 1982 when PK famously went into the hairpin backwards at one point. Ligier was running a calculated gamble in this race to get Panis as far up as they possibly could when the stops came round. Instead of putting fuel in for around 28 laps, as Williams had done with Damon for instance, Ligier decided to just brim the tank and then only change tyres like they do in Formula 1 today. That way, Olivier would be losing less time in the pit lane and while he would be slower at the start of the race, he would get quicker as the race went on. And it was a genius move. Panis had managed to get himself into fourth and was chasing Irvine, catching the Northern Irishman out with a brave dive bomb into the Lowe's hairpin on lap 36. Now Irvine had undone his belts after the incident believing he was out, but miraculously he got a push start from the marshals to get him out of the wall, and that got the Ferrari jump started again. What's even better here is that Ferrari had no idea that this could be done because Formula 1 engines don't have a starter motor attached to them, it's all done externally. Eddie had to come back into the pits to get his seatbelts redone, and that cost him a bit of time. And with the race almost a foregone conclusion, Hill passed the pit lane at the end of lap 40 and said to the team that a red light had come on his dashboard. The team radioed back, saying that there were no anomalies on their screens in the pit lane, and told him to carry on. Then halfway around the lap, Hill's engine blew up as he went through the tunnel because the oil pump had failed, and that had sprayed a bit of oil onto the track. It denied Damon the chance to emulate his father Graham with a win on the streets of Monaco. And fun fact, Graham never won the British Grand Prix. Damon did. Graham won the Monaco Grand Prix. Damon never did. But what was despair for Williams was joy for Benetton because Alesi was now in the lead, and Panis was promoted to second despite losing 10 seconds after a spin on Hill's oil. Then on lap 51, Alesi was in the pit lane. Unscheduled. He was complaining of a handling problem, but the team couldn't work out what was wrong with the car, so they just put some fresh slicks on and sent him on his way. But on the next lap, a lazy returned to the pits again to retire the car. The suspension had gone on his Benetton, and it cost him a potentially easy victory. Jean Alesi bad luck strikes again. And this promoted Panis into the lead. Sabu were pleased too. All the carnage meant that while Panis was leading and Coulthard was running second, Herbert and Frenson were still third and fourth. With Olivier leading, it was now Anne Panis that was looking like the silly one. And it was tense for all concerned. For Anne, her new husband was leading a Grand Prix. For Ligier, it would be their first win since 1981. For Mugen, it would be their first ever victory in F1. And for the locals, it would be a French driver in a French car, dressed up in the colours of a French cigarette company, winning in Monaco. Coulthard's McLaren was closing in, and Olivier was radioed by his team telling him to go easy on fuel. But I can see David in my mirrors everywhere, he radioed back. On lap 66, Luca Bedoa's slow 40 took out Villeneuve on the run into the hairpin. Hakkinen in the process was promoted to 5th, and Mika Salo's Tyrrell followed him through into 6th. How slow was Bedoa going? He was 6 laps down. Wasn't F1 competitive? At McLaren, they were convinced that Olivier would hit trouble and have to pit for fuel. Neil Oatley, who designed the MP411, took a chance with the rest of the team to have David back off slightly so they could just cruise to victory when Panis inevitably had to pit. But over at Ligier, they feared the same. Panis's race engineer, Paolo Cotoni, radioed the Frenchman with about two laps to go. Olivier, we have to pit, we don't have enough fuel to get to the end. But Olivier ignored the instruction. Jamie Winkup likes this. Look, Paolo, he eventually replied, we could be heroes, or we can end up looking like idiots. If I run out of fuel before the end, bad luck. But if I win, we win. I ain't stopping. Not long after that conversation, Irvine's bad day ended where teammate Schumacher's had on the very first lap. 
He had just spun and then flipped the car around and, unsighted, Hakkinen and Salo joined him in a three-car pileup at Lower Mirabeau. But luck was on Panis' side. The two-hour time limit expired and the chequered flag dropped just three laps before the planned end. The most improbable win had just happened. And after the race, the team tried to restart the car. There wasn't enough fuel left to turn the engine over. Although, there was enough fuel in the tank to get through the post-race scrutineering checks for weight and fuel samples. And only three cars crossed the line in the end. Panis, Coulthard and Herbert. Frentzen was running last and pulled into the pits on the final lap as he was finishing last anyway and everybody else had seen the chequered flag. Only Panis, Coulthard and Herbert were counted as finishing, even though Frentzen was still running. Frentzen was classified fourth and Salo and Hakkinen were given fifth and sixth, as they had met their end just after Irvine, who was classed seventh. Even though Salo hit Hakkinen from behind, he actually finished in front of him, because he'd retired after Hakkinen, if that makes any sense. Olivier Panis never won another race, but was having a great 1997 season where he would have been on course for fourth in the standings, which was later third after Schumacher's expulsion, had it not been for a horrendous accident at Montreal in which he broke both of his legs. The Ligier team was later sold to Alain Prost and became the Prost Grand Prix team between 1997 and 2001 when it collapsed. Panis would later race for BAR and Toyota after a stint with the Prost Grand Prix team that encompassed a career of 158 Grand Prix ice racing and nursing his son's career. Panis was also the last Frenchman to win a race, until Pierre Gasly won the 2020 Italian Grand Prix. Panis was also one of four drivers to win a Grand Prix in 1996, alongside Hill, Villeneuve and Schumacher. In fact, 1998 only saw four winners as well, Hakkinen, Coulthard, Schumacher and Hill. After sulking up in the Ferrari motorhome for a while, Schumacher emerged to face the media. I'm extremely upset, he told them. Upset and angry with myself because I alone am responsible for this mistake. It's an incredible mistake. I hit the curb, couldn't control the car, and it's all my fault. Schumacher's first win for Ferrari would have to wait, but while it hadn't been a successful day for Schumacher, at least his helmet had returned to the podium. He also collected the tricolour on his inlap. When I was handed the French flag, I couldn't resist taking it, he said. Ever since I saw Alain Prost do it, I always wanted to see it happen again but who could imagine it would be my turn next? So this has been the trip through time that is the 1996 Monaco Grand Prix. If you've enjoyed this addition to the archives, then you can show your support through the YouTube version of this podcast by clicking like and subscribing so you'll be notified of whenever a new one of these goes up. For Spotify listeners, why not share the living daylights out of this podcast and get it out there? And if you are here because it was recommended to you via Spotify's algorithms, why not follow to get more of these delivered straight to your inbox? I think that's how this works. I actually don't follow any podcasts on Spotify. Oops. That Racing History Podcast is a Patreon-backed show, and if you wish to help support this podcast or just my YouTube channel in general at a more personal level, then you can do so by heading to the Patreon page at patreon.com slash Aidan Millward. That's A-I-D-A-N-M-I-L-L-W-A-R-D. So Aidan with an A and not an E. And you can also follow me on Twitter, Instagram, and all that good stuff. And there is also a Discord where you can join in the chat there. For YouTube listeners, all that stuff is handily in the description box for you. So until next time, I've been Aidan Mild with That Racing History Podcast. Have a great day wherever you are, and goodbye.